Pastor Michael's sermon last Sunday morning when he talked about the last days. Someday we're going to be taken away and we're going to be resurrected and given a new body. And I'm looking forward to that day. I hope you are too. I want to welcome you all here. If you're a visitor this morning, we're so happy to have you this morning. And I want to invite you just to join in and sing with us. We're going to sing... A little bit later, this song we did last week, Graves in the Gardens, and 
I noticed last week you all have a special way of clapping for that that I think uh, Hector taught you. And I want to just encourage you to, to do that when we, when we sing that and participate in, uh, participate in the joy of the Lord with us. We lift up your name, we adore you, we lift up your name, you are creator, you spoke, your breath brought forth up your name we adore you we lift up your name you are creator you spoke your breath brought forth give you honor and glory for you alone are worthy. Why oh, search the world? It couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures and faith. Never enough and you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better God 
out of the valley There's not a place your mercy and grace will find me Turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one. to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Good morning, Fellowship Covenant Church. How are you today? It is great to see you all here and to be together this morning. And uh, we have a few announcements of things that are coming up this month. We've got a lot of different stuff happening. Uh, the first is that after the service today, we have our food bank open downstairs. We've got a whole bunch of really good stuff uh, downstairs. So come check out the food bank afterwards if you have some neighbors or some friends or, or whoever who might need some groceries as well. Um, that'll be open downstairs um, after the service. And uh, uh, just really excited to be able to continue to provide that. That's been going really well, and uh, it's been uh, just great getting to see some of the new people that are being blessed by that as well. Um, we've had a number of people who are from the community outside of our church uh, from the area that have been coming and, and uh, joining us for that. And I encourage us as, as people and members of this church to reach out to them and just get to know them and, and uh, welcome them, invite them to to maybe even grab lunch, who knows, uh, uh, but invite them to our services, invite them to our different events, uh, have a conversation with them, and uh, uh, our goal is for that to be an outreach for our church. Uh, it's for, some, for us to be able to reach this community that we're in and to provide um, and help to lift people up, and, uh, and that's one way that we're looking to do that in our community today. So um, uh, that'll be open after the service downstairs in the kitchen. All that stuff is staged in the kitchen. Um, there's, there's meat, there's eggs, there's lots of different stuff down there. I mean, lots of different stuff. So uh, come join us after the service if you need spices and condiments. We've got a ton of random like condiments and, and things like that that are down there too. Um, so anyway, uh, those are some of the new, newer items that are going to be down there today. But uh, other things that are coming up, we have youth group tonight, 6 o'clock here at the church. Uh, join us for youth group tonight. If you're uh, junior high or high school, it's going to be a great time. They have lots of fun. They play games. And... Um, uh, I'm getting a little feedback, uh, <laughs> but um, join us for that. It's going to be great. They have a lot of fun. We have another thing coming up for our elementary uh, for for those who are able to or who are of the right age to watch it. But uh, um, we have on uh, during spring break um, on the twentieth of this month, uh, Wednesday the twentieth, we have at five o'clock here at the church. We're going to be doing a Narnia night, and uh, we'll be downstairs having a, a movie night. We have a a big screen that we're going to have down there, and uh, we'll watch uh, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, the first movie, together. 
and um, we'll uh, enjoy that. It'll, it'll be a fun time. There'll be food. Uh, they're going to be doing fish and chips because, you know, it's Chronicles of Narnia, so fish and chips fits. And, and so GB's Fish and Chips is going to be providing fish and chips for that night for, for the students. Parents are invited to join their kids for that as well. So if you're a parent, you know, the fish and chips are amazing. But uh, anyway, um, and I think there'll be some raffled prizes and things like that as well. It's going to be a great time. So on uh, Wednesday the 20th at 5 o'clock here at the church, that's going to be uh, happening. Uh, other things that are going to be happening as well this month, we have Palm Sunday um, after that, and we have Easter is the last weekend of this month. And uh, Easter this month, uh, really excited. It's, it's happening really early this year, uh, coming in March. And so uh, the last weekend of March is our Easter service. Uh, 9.15, we're going to have a breakfast for Easter. We're going to have an Easter brunch. And so if you want to bring a dish for that, talk to Cheryl, or there's a sign-up sheet out in the uh, Welcome Center that you can sign up on to bring a dish. And uh, Cheryl will connect with you, make sure that she's got your information so she can reach out to you if, uh, if she doesn't have the details for you. And um, she's in the doorway if you're looking for who to connect with. Um, you can also talk to um, uh, B as well. And uh, that's going to be just a fantastic time. We also have, uh, after our breakfast at 9.15, we're going to have an egg hunt for uh, children. And so uh, our, our children, elementary or even younger than that, toddlers, all the way through uh, high school, we will have an egg hunt here at the church, depending on whether it'll be inside or outside, but uh, uh, lots of great prizes in those and lots of different candy and things like that in those. Uh, if you want to donate candy for that, we are uh, looking to receive candy. The only thing that we try and avoid is peanuts in, in the candy that gets donated because we just don't know who's coming. Uh, but uh, if it doesn't have peanuts, it's probably fair game. And so if you want to donate candy, um, we would love for you guys to be able to partner with that. Um, if you're looking to donate prizes as well, I think talk to Jackie, but uh, I think that there's plans for prizes to be handed out as well, like they've done in, in years past where there's kind of a big prize uh, for different eggs or collecting a certain amount of eggs or different colors or whatever. So uh, anyway, uh, those are some of the things that are happening this month. Um, if you guys weren't able to make it to uh, yesterday's Exchange Life Ministry Conference, uh, we had 24 people there. It was a fantastic time uh, just getting some training and uh, uh, just hearing about our identity in Christ and who God made us to be and uh, the true, uh, just the, the complete gospel and hearing what that uh, means for our lives. And so uh, we will have another one of those in the future. I don't know if it's going to be this year. It might be next year, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, late, stay tuned later this year. We might have another one, and it's going to be a fantastic time um, to be able to do that. It's something that is not just for you guys. It's also something to help equip you to have these conversations with other people in your life. And so uh, it's, it's something that's valuable for us, but it's also valuable for the people in our lives to, to hear that training. So um, it was a great time. We had a, we had a blast and uh, uh, got a lot of information. And uh, I got to teach my first session as, uh, as doing part of that. So I actually got to teach yesterday. It was a good time. Uh, but we had a really great time together. So uh, with that, let me just pray and bless this morning. And uh, uh, we'll uh, commit this morning to God if you'd bow your heads with me. Father, today we just thank you so much for your grace, Lord, for your mercy, for your glory. Lord, we're just humbled. We're awestruck by your majesty, God. And Lord, we thank you for the blessings you've given us. We thank you that we can gather together. We thank you that we can call each other brother and sister in this room. Lord, that we can unite together around the gospel, around the word of Christ. Lord, that we can, we can take your word and we can live by it. We can learn from it. We can enjoy it. We can have conversation with you through prayer and through reading your word. And Father, that you speak to us still today. And Lord, I pray that, that uh, as we hear the word today, as we worship, Lord, that our hearts would be focused on you, that we'd hear what you have to speak to us today, Lord. That our hearts would be open to what you have to say to us today, Lord. And Lord, that we would leave today energized, revitalized, changed, and challenged, Father. Yes, my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of 
to see what he is doing in our world today. And uh, uh, today we are, in, uh, we are wrapping up 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we're going to go through the rest of the chapter. If you've been following with us, um, we're going to be going through the end of the chapter. So we're going to be covering uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 28 today. And, uh, you know, um, question for you guys today. I was looking back at some pictures and, and from my life and, uh, uh, you know, I've been, I have just thousands and thousands of pictures. The advent of the cell phone camera has been very dangerous on my hard drive storage. And, uh, and so I've been trying to organize all these. And one of the folders that I came across uh, was a folder called Stranded. And uh, Stranded was a camp that I worked at. I was an instructor at this. It's a, a missionary survival um, preparedness uh, training camp. And uh, the goal of this camp, uh, Stranded, uh, that my friend runs, uh, is to equip people who are looking to serve in the remotest parts of the world, um, in the most dangerous parts of the world, to be a Christian in, uh, to equip them for hostage situations, if they were ever to be taken hostage, uh, to equip them for sharing the gospel in hostile, uh, closed country scenarios like North Korea, um, and Pakistan, a lot of the different countries that are, that are close to the gospel, Somalia, things like that. Um, and uh, so we put 
we put the candidates through a, a number of different things. And have you guys ever done some of those team exercise uh, training things that they do? You guys know what I'm talking about with team exercises? It might be like a, a, there's a log on the ground, um, or maybe they did this in the office place and there's a piece of tape on the ground. And uh, you have everyone line up randomly, and then you have to organize yourselves without stepping off of the tape. You have to organize yourselves from tallest to smallest. Um, or, or maybe you have to organize yourselves by birth date, but like certain people are not allowed to talk. Have you guys ever done any of that? Any of you guys uh, experienced some of those uh, ex- uh, team exercises and kind of team building things? Okay, apparently I'm the only one. Um, I've done a number of these. I grew up going to camp. I mean, I went to camp for school. I went to camp for, and then we, you know, we had the uh, outdoor days or whatever they, they were called these days now, um, where we, you know, we'd have you know, outdoor stuff and we'd be learning about nature and things. And that was for public school. And then when I, I would uh, go to church groups and, and at camp, we would have all these different team building exercises. And there was a number of different things that we would do. And uh, uh, I grew up doing that. I grew up doing these different things. Uh, and, you know, it might be like build a fire, you know, something as simple as build a fire at camp. Or, or it could be something like, you know, take a line and, and you have to organize yourself. I saw our youth group play this, so I know that the youth kids in, uh, that are downstairs, they've done this stuff before. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, there's a number of different team building exercises you can do. One of the ones that I've seen most frequently uh, when, I, when I've been up at, like, Camp Idra Haji, uh, that's up in Bailey, um, that's a real close one. Um, but I've also seen this at Camp Elam, another great camp in Colorado. Um, we did this at Stranded when I was an instructor was there was this spider web that we would construct between two trees. And the spider web was a bunch of string that was strung up, and some of it would be taller than me, and some, there might be a gap at the bottom, you know, between the two trees. So you have two strings that are strung across, and, and then you have a bunch of strings that are tied in between, and depending on the place, like they're made of bungee cord or they're made of, you know, taut string, and um, that doesn't really stretch. It just depends on the place. And your goal is to kind of get every member of your team through a different hole in the spider web. And no one gets to start on the other side of the spider web. Everyone has to start on one side. And after you use a hole, that hole is no longer usable. And we would, you know, some people, you, you get like the, the crazy, like super gymnast person, you know, might, might be the, a girl, might be a guy or, you know, whatever. All of a sudden, they're just like running and diving through a random hole, trying to, you know, land and then tumbling afterwards to... To, to make sure they don't hurt themselves as they land. And, you know, that hole that they went through would be probably one of the difficult holes, and they had to have that precision. And, but what happened is if you touched the, the string, well, you know, the punishment varied depending on the camp and depending on what the goal was. And, and so some of the camps I was at, well, you know, it just meant you started over or whatever, you know. Um, or maybe another camp, it might mean, like, if you touch the, if you touch the string, one person is muted. They're no longer allowed to talk. And uh, we would use these things as team building exercises and as leadership training exercises. You know, we we would do this stuff and, and, you know, you always have these natural born leaders that they kind of just rise to the occasion. Generally, there were some groups we had that had no leaders. Uh, We had no people who would step up and, and no people who really wanted to call shots. And they might be in the back being like, oh, I don't want to do it that way. But they're not saying it out loud and they're not taking charge. And uh, then you have other people who are like, you know, real ostentatious and, and they're like the go-getters and they're going to make sure that we do this right the first time. And, and uh, you know, we, we assume that they're the best leader because they're just being the loudest. And, and so as an as a instructor of these different games, your goal is to try and identify who's not talking but has the right idea and who's talking too much and has the wrong idea, and you want them to kind of, you, you want them to fail. You know, when we were at Stranded, failure meant something big. You know, uh, when we were instructors at Stranded, they'd be camping out for a week, and so they were outside uh, in the Nebraska weather, rain or shine, uh, camping out in this uh, pasture, this field, uh, not the most friendly environment that we would put them into, and they had tent. Some of them, sometimes they had shelter, like a tarp or tent and sleeping bags and water bottles and maybe a little bit of food with them. 
Usually there was a, only a little bit of food because we were intentionally kind of fasting them. We'll call it fasting. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, what we would do for this particular exercise is we would write different things on eggs. So I would write tent or shelter on an egg. I would write water on an egg. And these were just raw eggs. They weren't hard-boiled eggs. I would write a uh, knife on an egg. Or uh, I would write um, flashlights on an egg or something. And we'd have like, you know, a dozen eggs with different items that they were using while they were camping. And they had to carry these eggs on them while they did these exercises. And if the egg got crushed, they lost that item for the duration of their camping. And so there was real, there was real things at stake with this. And uh, when I went through it, because before I was an instructor, I went through it, you know, I was, I was uh, in pretty good shape at that point in my life. I was, I was Mr. Monkey Man. I was doing parkour and all this stuff. You guys don't know what parkour is. It doesn't really matter. But uh, basically, I could run, jump, climb, and swim pretty well at that point in my life. And, uh, and so I, you know, I was the dude who just, I grabbed the tree, and there was this tiny little slow thing, and I, I fit through there, and I fit there, through there just perfectly, didn't touch the web or anything like that, and I just did it literally by hugging the tree and shuffling around. But what I didn't realize is I had tied that egg to my side, and somehow it shifted around my belt, and now it was between me and the tree that I was hugging so closely and so tightly, and, uh, you know, it broke. And uh, my team was not super happy with me. And uh, that, that cost us uh, some resources. You know, at Stranded, we designed it so that you would fail. That you would lose basically all of your eggs. And then we would make like a Christ-like um, thing where someone would have to camp out alone in the pasture uh, by themselves without any resources um, in order to be able to save the resources that their team would have. And uh, that was kind of the way that we would structure this. And we intentionally made it so they'd break all their eggs and lose all their eggs. They touch the web, they lose an egg. You know, whoever touched the, egg, uh, the web, they lost whatever egg they were holding. And so, you know, it was designed to create a stressful scenario. And they needed leaders. They needed this person who would say, this is, the, this is what's happening next. This is what we got to do. This is, you know, hey, man, I know you're, you're trying hard, but you need to stop. You know, sometimes you need people to tell you to stop. Uh, we need leaders. Leadership's important. And in our culture, we talk about leadership all the time. I mean, you know, there's a whole entire genre of self-help books that is designed to make you a better leader. And, you know, I love, I've talked about them before, you know, uh, I, I love like 360 degree leader and, and some of those um, um, books by John. And, and uh, you know, I, I've read a number of those. I've met him before. And but the reality is, is those books don't necessarily help us all the time when we're trying to be biblical leaders. When we're trying to be a biblical leader, it can look very different from what the world's leadership structure is. You know, I've, I've, I've done a number of competitive sports, and, and you always have that one guy who's just barking orders and, and shouting at people and stuff. And maybe it's your, maybe it's your coach, but sometimes there's a, a teammate that, that has kind of stepped into that role to bark orders and kind of chastise people and you know we, we we have these different roles that we take on and you know in your workplace you might have you know the bad guy that does all the you know the busting of, of different people and tells them to get back to work and you know all that sort of stuff and in some ways those are essential but as we look at biblical leadership today and leadership within the church as we wrap up this chapter I want us to think about what it means to be a leader you know, this, this passage, it has a number of things that it listed in. I could just go through this passage and just be like, okay, this is a do and don't list. It's, it's do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. The reality is, is that there's something much deeper going on here as well. Because it's something that's throughout Scripture. You see again and again in different parallel passages what's happening in this same passage. You see it in Romans and and in other, and in other books. And, and the reality is, is that what we're going to learn about today is important for us as a church in how we approach leading and serving amongst each other. We need leaders in our church. We need people who are willing to step up and do things in our church, to call each other out, 
That's a biblical thing. You know, I have, I have friends who are talking just this last 24 hours, they've been talking about, you know, judging others. And, and I said, well, I think we need to define what judgment is and uh, have a conversation about that because the reality is, is that we need people who are going to call us out on stuff within our church family. So let's read this passage and we can discuss this passage together. Starting in uh, chapter 5, verses 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I decided not to preach on that topic. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I joke about that because I had a friend who uh, decided to preach on uh, greet each other with a holy kiss. And, and I ended up getting kissed by him, which was not my favorite experience in my, in my life, but he ambushed me. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, you know we, could, we could cherry pick one verse out of this thing. We could cherry pick, you know, um, yesterday we had our ELM conference, and one of the verses that we talked about in the Exchange Life Ministry Conference was this passage, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. The idea that we are a three-part person. We have the body, we have the soul, and the spirit. And so, you know, that's one thing I could have, talked about with this is, is focusing on the fact that we are a, uh, it's called trichotomy. We are a, a trichotomous person. Um, we have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit as followers of Christ. And that's what sets us distinct from animals. That's that spirit that's within us. I could have talked about that. I could, I could have spent time on that. But the reality is, is that when I broke this passage down, one of the things I like to do when I'm, I'm going through a study of a different, of a different passage is I will break it out and uh, I will create kind of an outline that has subpoints, and I will take the different punctuation and, and the different uh, conjunctions and things like that, you know, ands and fours and buts and things like that, and I will mark them out and make an outline that shows kind of where the main points actually break out, what is being communicated to us. And when I did that today, when, or when I did that this week, I should say, the the the, the way that this passage broke out is it was talking about leadership and how leadership trickles down into the most basic fundamental parts of our faith. The most basic fundamental parts of following Christ. You know, as we look at this, pot, this passage, the, the, the Thessalonian church, the reason this gets mentioned is the Thessalonian church must have had some sort of deficiency. You know, Paul is instructing them on leadership to begin with, and he talks about those who, um, it says uh, in, uh, in verse 12, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And what it sounds like as we study this passage is that, you know, we know that Paul got run out of town because of persecution, he had established a church there, but he hadn't established the church to the degree that it had a leadership structure. You know, we see in other parts of, of Scripture where he says, appoint elders among you. You know, they, the, the early church, they would make deacons 
within the church, and, and they had these different leadership positions. We have leadership positions within our church. We have our trustee board, which are like elders in the Bible. We use the, the qualifications of elders and overseers for our trustees. You know, we have deacons, and the deacons for our church are, are members of our church who are serving in different capacities, whether it's youth leader or whether it's a children's uh, leader or a children's director. Uh, those are all different roles as deacons within our church. And there's certain qualities that we seek to see within these people that are, are pursuing those. Well, with the Thessalonian church, they didn't have the opportunity, it seems like, to be able to make this formal. They didn't have the opportunity before Paul left or, or before Timothy left to be able to say, okay, this guy is the leader. Or this, this, these people, they are exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit in a way that they are worthy of being called leaders, elders, deacons. And so what he's saying here is he's, he's pointing to people from afar, and he's saying, listen, there are people among you, and you can identify them. You know who these people are. They are serving, they are admonishing, and they are over you. Now, we hear that, and we hear that translated into English today, and we say, okay, so... Well, you know, they're over them, so they have some sort of authority over them, and, and they're laboring, it says, and so we know that they're just they're serving, and we know that uh, they're admonishing, so maybe it is the hard person that's calling everyone out on their junk. Maybe it is the, the, the person who's just like, you know, cutting heads off and, and making sure that things are orderly and, and, and barking orders. Is that what admonishing is? Well, let's break these three down. The word for labor here is actually the word for toil. It is, it is, uh, it is a word that is specifically used to denote extreme exertion. It's not just a, a, it's not just a, a person who's laboring, who's just working at the church or in the community. It's a person who is pouring out from themselves self-sacrificially to the people in their community. To the people in that church. It's a person who is giving of themselves. There is a loss of themselves in order to be able to do this for the people, whatever it might be that they're serving in, whatever capacity that is. So for those who are self-sacrificially giving in their church, that's who's being talked about. That's the person who's being talked about. They labored, whether through helping serve the meals, whether it's through, you know, pre preparation or, or, you know, helping in different needs in the community and taking care of the, the orphans and the widows and different stuff like that. They had intentionally been giving of themselves and sacrificing for the sake of the community at that church. And he says, you know who these people are. You could probably look around and you could identify who is serving hard who is giving of themselves that's not necessarily a hard thing to identify in a church community and paul's saying this is where you start when you're looking for your leaders the second is those who are over you and we might think well this is denoting that there were some people who actually were appointed as leaders well not necessarily and that in this time of the world you know Benefaction, the, the word here in over you is, is benefactor, it is patron, it is um, a person who uh, is a protector. Uh, that, that idea that uh, someone is over you is someone who is defending you, someone who is the reason you're able to operate, the patron. And so we see this word actually, the, the, uh, a form of this verb gets used in Romans 16, to, to mark Phoebe, a woman, by the way, Phoebe, who is serving in her community. She is a patron of Paul, and she is a patron of the church and many others, it says. So they are to respect Phoebe. They are to esteem Phoebe. They are to give greater love to Phoebe because of the benefaction and the protection and the, 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 the enablement of ministry that she is providing. We see that in, in Romans 16. 
That's the same word here, this, this word that is over you. It's not just authority. There's a lot of other um, uses of this word in, in, uh, in Greek. And so as we look at this, we have to think, okay, well, it's not just uh, someone who's appointed. It's also someone who is exhibiting these attributes, again, of support and exertion, patronage and benefactor, of protector. Who is it among you that is protecting the flock, enabling the flock, enabling the congregation to serve, to worship, to minister, and meeting the needs that are there. So that's over you, those who are over you. And then finally we see admonish, and that's those who who gave counsel. Admonishing is not just a, a person who's, you know, coming out there and being, you know, being the drill sergeant, you know. Uh, I was watching a video the other day, and, and it was a drill sergeant who was barking out, you know, doing push-ups to, to soldiers and uh, about different stuff, and one of them was that they had, a, like, a triceratops that had shown up or something, and so he goes off on them about this little triceratops, you know, that they had, this little toy that they had. And, uh, you know, it's, that's not what we're talking about here, okay? We're not talking about just a drill sergeant that's barking orders left and right, or in, you know, with all insensitivity and all harshness. That's not what admonishing means. Admonishing, the word here for admonishing is actually often uh, linked to parenting. And as a parent, you know your goal is for your kids to turn out better than you. Generally, that's our, that's most, like I would say 99% of parents, their goal is for their kids to turn out better than them. You know, our, our hope, if you, if you are a parent, you know that you feel a burden for your children. At least I hope you do. And as we think about what it means to be a parent, there's times when your, your kids go off the reservation. As a kid, you know, I had my moments off the reservation. You know, I, I, you know, I, I was engaged before I uh, met Leah. I had been engaged one time before. I had an engagement that I had to break off. And uh, I had to hear from my parents on that. And I actually heard from one of the elders in the church who came and admonished me. And he said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And this guy in particular knew uh, at the time, my fiance at the time, very well. She was a nanny for his kids. And so he, he came to me and he said, what are you doing? You need to get out of this relationship. This is not God's will for you. And he said it, he sat me down and he said it like a parent to a child. It was one of the, one of the best conversations I've ever had within the church. I remember that and I appreciate that moment so much. I remember there's was, there was another girl that I was dating and uh, I, I was talking about, you know, the situation of going off to college and and, and all this stuff, and I'm like, well, you know, I don't know, like, if we were, like, because, you know, as a Christian man growing up in the church, I knew that the point of dating was not just to, to, to fool around and, and stuff. I knew that the point for uh, meeting a girl and, and having a relationship with a girl was to hopefully someday get married, and so every relationship that I entered into when I was growing up was hopefully someone that I would you know, if, if there was a point where I realized they weren't someone I could marry, that relationship had to end. And so, you know, and I had another relationship I was in, and my, I was sitting there, and I was talking, and I said the word, you know, I said, well, marriage, and, and you know, I, I just said that word, and it, we were far off from this point, but my dad said, or you could just dump her. And my dad, if you know my dad, that's like the furthest thing from anything he would ever say. I mean, he just said, or you could dump her. You could, you could break up with her. My dad hadn't sounded off on this relationship at all. And just a conversation between me and my mom in the family room, my dad overheard it, and just peanut gallery from the kitchen. And it was so out of character for my dad to do something like that, to say something like that. But what that showed me, because I knew my dad well enough, was that he cared about the situation enough to say something. It was such an unhealthy and bad situation, he had to say something. He usually wouldn't do any of that. You know, we have parenting, you know, when I, when I talk to my kids, you know, uh, I'll have one of my kids, my, the, the, my kids are small, they like to bite each other still, a couple of them anyway. 
And, uh, you know, and, and it starts out as playful biting, you know. My little, my little Dwayne will bite my toe randomly, and he's 10 months old. So it's like, you know, that's funny, even if it's a little bit shocking and painful when he does it. Because his teeth are razor blades still. But, uh, you know, it's, with, with John, biting's not as okay, right? Like, he's doing it out of vindication, and he's doing it out of anger. And so we're trying to, to teach uh, the kids to, to not bite each other, not to hurt each other. You know, you'll hear that, you know, all of a sudden, someone gets whacked with a stick outside, and Millie will run inside. He hit him with a stick! And, and you'll, you know, like, okay, which one hit which one? And then you'll have to talk with them and sit them down and have a corrective conversation with them. But well, you do that as you grow up. You don't do your homework. You, a parent sits their kid down and says, you need to do your homework or you're going to fail school. And if you fail school, you're not going to get a job. And you're, you're not going to get a job. You're not going to be able to raise a family. You're not going to be able to survive the world. You're not going to be able to be a productive adult. You know, we, we try to instruct our kids in these ways. That's what this admonishment is. It's a parent to a child. Who among us is seeking to be a parent to those who are younger. We see throughout the whole New Testament that the older instruct the younger. They teach the younger. And the younger are, are to respect the older. But that relationship is to look like father, mother, and child. We see what it's like. You know, we know that it says, don't exacerbate your children when it's instructing fathers. So we can feel, I don't know if you've ever felt this, but I've definitely felt exacerbation from some people in churches. You know, I, I keep a file of, of, I have a good, this is something that was recommended to me a long time ago, it's a good file and a bad file. And I have a file of, of things that are encouraging and notes that have been written to me and letters and cards and things like that. It got real full in December with all of you guys giving us cards and and uh, that thing is just stuffed right now. I love it. The good folder is just packed full. And then I'll also put in there, I have a bad file. And I'll print out an email that someone fired off that's just some incendiary, rude, and, and just downright mean email. Not coming from a good place. I'll, I'll put in there text messages that I've received. I'll print out the text message and put that in there. And what I love, it's not so much that I can hold a record of all of these things. That's not the goal. The goal is so that I can take both of these folders and I can put them side by side. And I can see all, when I'm feeling discouraged, I can see all of the times that as a church we were encouraging, when, when people were, were supporting and lifting uh, me up, and I can see how few people are sounding off about the issues or, or the garbage or, or saying just mean and hurtful things. It's to show the comparison of how frequently these things happen. Now I get a, I get a little, when, when she's here, I get a little note from Janet, uh, Jeanette Schlegel. She's probably watching online. And, uh, you know, when she's here, I, I have so many of these little notes in my file. I was just saying, great sermon, Michael. I love it. You know, I've had phone calls after a service saying great service. And I, I keep those. I keep that because it's such an important part of getting through the hard times. When you're a pastor, when you're serving in anything, if you guys have served in anything, you know that there's incredibly discouraging moments that you hit. So we have laboring, pouring out sacrificially. We have being over, the, the, the benefactors and the patrons and, and those who are protectors of, of the community. Those who are naturally born into that kind of leadership personality. And, and those also we have who admonish, who are willing to call each other out in love and to call us to a higher standard in love and are able to approach these things well. These are the people that he's pointing the Thessalonian church to emulate and to esteem and to give extra love to. He doesn't use the word respect here. I want to be clear about this. It's not about respect them. He says to give them more love. To give them more love. 
esteem them very highly in love because of their work. As we think about what that means to love those who love on us, that's essentially what he's saying. Those who are loving on us in the various ways that they can do that, we need to love them greatly. We need to love them more. This isn't just about me. I'm, you know, as I approach this, I'm like, great, the pastor's going to pe- preach on respecting the pastor today. That was my first instinct as I read through this passage. I'm like, that's not how I want this to go. And so as I got into the Word, I'm like, oh, praise God, that's not exactly what this is saying. This is saying to, res- to, to love those who are serving, to love those who are seeking to further this community that we have. And like I said, this is a parallel passage. This is, this is something that's instructed again and again in Scripture in the New Testament for the churches. So a parallel passage to this is Romans 12, 3 through 21, we'll say. 3 through 21. And uh, Romans 12, 3 through 21, I'm going to read this, and I just want you to hear the, the, the similarities between our passage. If you have uh, 1 Thessalonians in front of you, you can find it in, your, in the Bibles in the back of the pew, but you can also follow along with Romans 12, uh, 3 through 21 here on the screen. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service, In our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. (laughs) Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The parallels run throughout this entire passage between these two. There's so many different parallels in here. But this is giving us an outline. It's just something for us to, to meditate on and to dwell on. What I would encourage you this week is to take... 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 28, to meditate on it. To, to read it again and again and make this a part of your daily habit for this week. To take Romans 12, 3 through 21, and to meditate on this passage. And the things that are said in these passages, and, and to meditate on what it says and how does it apply to your life. To pray through this list and say, Father, would you make this shine in me? Would you, would you grow this character in me? Would you grow these traits in me? Would you help me to be someone who admonishes, not like a drill sergeant, but like a parent? Would you help me to labor like someone who is actually giving of themselves? Would you help me to be someone who protects who, who exhibits authority over the community in a healthy way? Someone who, who is seeking to, to create opportunity and to benefit the community. 
to further the congregation. The parallels run through these whole things. Let love be genuine. The sincerity of a parent when admonishing the child, when we relate to each other, it's vital we do so with a desire to bless and increase the other person. Be, patient, uh, be at peace among yourselves. It is 1 Thessalonians 5, 13 and 19. Romans 12, uh, 12, 16. Rejoice always and pray continuously. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17. And Romans 12, 12. Abhor what is evil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22 and Romans 12, 9. Do not return evil for evil. This is one that I grew up with. My mom would quote this to me all the time. And praise God that my mom knew her scripture better than I did at the time. Being a parent, one of the best things you can do is have scripture memorized so that you can speak it to your children. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Give them the one who is wise. Do not return evil for evil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 and Romans 12, 17 through 21. You know, I grew up hearing, do not return evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. My mom would say that to me again and again and again and again and again. When my brothers hit me with a stick, or my brothers bit me, or, or my brothers did something to, you know, attack me, or, or maybe it wasn't my brothers, maybe it was my friends, because sometimes friends fight, and you know, I'd have a friend that, that would do something to me. My mom would say, do not return evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. There's the added benefit that it might be heaping coals on their head. You know, we kind of like that part. But the reality is, is that that's not the goal. The goal is to show them the love of Jesus Christ. When we think about where we see in Scripture that coal is placed on the head, we see that that's a, a purifying act in Isaiah, his lips are, are purified by coal. Are we returning evil for evil? And that instruction isn't just for how we treat believers. It says for the brothers and for everyone. It's not just for us as a community. See, Paul is starting with the leadership and he's saying this is what makes a good leader. These are the character traits, the qualities of a good leader. And from there he's saying, and these traits should be emulated and a desire for every person in the congregation and the community. And we should be at peace with each other. We should seek peace always with each other. We should be lifting each other up in prayer. And we should be rejoicing together. We should be weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who jo rejoice. And we should be lifting up the lowly. We should be lifting up those who are weak. We need to come around each other. And, and we should not be returning evil because evil is going to get done to us. But we need to return good for evil. And not just to people who are Christians. Not just to people who are in the church. But to every person we meet. To every person we meet. We need to be returning good. Seeking to bless them. Seeking to show them the love of Christ. Being a leader is a good thing, and it's a good desire to have, the Bible says. We have a different approach than the world does to leadership when we are Christians. And we use the term servant leader frequently in Christian circles, but this is because leadership within the family of God is marked by a Christ-like self-sacrificial service. We esteem others more important than ourselves and we lift each other up Christ was willing to suffer for us to die for us so that we could participate in heaven with him he was already in heaven he was already there he already had the universe at his fingertips every pleasure every riches all of that was laid at his fingertips and he sacrificed that to come to earth for us to die for us. If you'd pray with me. Father, I pray that we would be leaders. But not leaders like the world shows us, not barking orders, not, not 
putting each other down, not, not seeking to climb the totem pole faster than everyone around us so we can get the promotion, so we can get the bigger pay, so we can have the higher status, so we can get the bigger car or the bigger house. But Lord, that we would be seeking to lift those around us up. That we would be bringing people closer to you in that lifting, God. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be burdened for those around us, to serve them, to admonish them, to love them, to protect them, to bestow the blessings that we've been given on them, to enable them to do the things that, that they might not be able to do otherwise, God. Lord, help us to be a community that lifts each other up. I pray this in your son Jesus' name. you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness benediction that's in this passage in verses 23 and 24 from from first Thessalonians 5 today now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely 
And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope we have in you. We thank you for the congregation, the community, the fellowship, the family that we have in you, Father. Lord, help us to follow you, and I pray that you would sanctify us, and you would lead us, and you would teach us how to lead each other in a godly way. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. God bless. Amen. Have a great week.